ten I need here. Mm. Could you start by telling us uh, how you got into the cotton mill, how old you were when you started, and what you made, and what you did? Uh, when I first started in the cotton mill, I was 17 years old. I made $7.60 for 55 hours. And, uh, uh, and when Roosevelt went in, uh, and he uh, raised wages up, and I, at that time I was fixing looms for $16.20 for 55 hours. Come around and told us starting Monday we're going on 40 hours and get $20. I couldn't believe that. So he cut me 15 hours and uh, give me some more money. And, uh, but that wasn't too long till it struck. And then when it struck, I, I didn't go back. Because they told us to go and ask for a job back. Roosevelt issued an ultimatum. Everybody called strike off and go back on your job like you came out. And uh, John Dean and Albert Cox and somebody else from the National Labor Relations Board going up to meet with the company management. And uh, they wouldn't agree to it. The only way the thing they'd agree to is come back and apply for a job. So I didn't belong to the union at that time, but I objected by calling the law that want to know why John Dean did. I said, because 13 weeks ago, you told these people to come out on strike. And now you tell them to go back up and ask for a job. And I said, I object to that on that one reason. And uh, it was about 80 or 90 blackballed out on that one account. <coughs> and uh, later on, I was elected to go to the Washington, D.C. before the NRLB on about 80 people is involved in being blackballed. And you know, we haven't heard from that today. No, sir, we haven't heard from that until today. What was like, it like testifying in Washington? Uh, see, uh, they, they had a committee there, then our LB did. Uh, they're in some place in, uh, is on Washington Street, I forget what building is in. But uh, they had a committee there. In our LB did, and uh, but uh, I never did hear from them at all. But uh, they were supposed after I proved what I was up there for, and proved to them that them people were blackballed, never was accepted back. They were supposed to have got us back pay, with and uh, but the ne we never did even hear from, them, much less get any money. Just wait a second, please. That car drives off. You're doing fine, though. This is exactly what we wanted to know. Okay. We're clear. But, uh... Now, I want you to go back in your mind and tell us what it was like going to Washington and testifying before that big committee. Well, uh... There wasn't about 10 or 12 of them in that committee. And, uh... Let's see, there's a lady there from uh, Hillside Cotton Mill in LaGrange, Georgia. And uh, one from uh, Hogan'sville, Georgia. And myself, that's the only three that I know was up there. You remember the name of the lady from Hogan'sville? No, no. And uh, I don't remember the man's name either. But, uh, uh, I never did go back and ask for a job, and so old Albert Cox, he wanted me to go help him organize the mill. I went with him over to Hogansville, Aragon, Georgia, Rockmark, Georgia, and uh, but Aragon, Georgia is where we, there's 
had a little trouble with. We thought we was going to have trouble, but we never did. Now, why did he want you to go with him? Uh, he, he knows I can persuade people to do things. And, uh, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of ways of getting things out of people besides ordering them to do it. You can persuade people to do anything if, you, if you've got the right attitude. And, uh, well, I, I uh, superintendents used to ask me, he said, how do you get things done? And I said, well, you'd be nice to them and tell them you appreciate it and you can get things done. And uh, Now, we have been told that you were Albert Cox's bodyguard. I, I don't reckon. We both carried a pistol. I had a 45 and he had a 32. Uh, I, he might have called me his bodyguard, but he was bigger than I was. Uh, but uh, he lived there at that old Muskogee mill, and he had a, a cerebral palsy son. And uh, he was out from that old Muskogee mill. That's where he got fired from. Was there any reason why he should have needed a bodyguard? No. Uh, but uh, you, you, the only time you'd need one was when Dwight Manufacturing Company bought all them pistols for that bunch of scabs down there. Uh, the Wiley Davison, Walt Hennigan, uh Fred Davison, Floyd Davison, B. Umbrell Davison, uh, uh, Mr. Watson, uh, uh, Mr. Walls, and uh, there's about 15 or 20 of them that they bought brand new 38 pistols for. And that's when we armed ourselves. People went home, had a shotgun, and brought a shotgun. Said it there beside the car, they had a pistol, and brought a pistol. And, but when, when they brought, the, brought all them people, them pistols, that's when we armed ourselves. And, uh, and that's when we, that's how come I said we had a bunch of clubs. Well, we wasn't going up there empty-handed, not in them a bunch of pistols. And we, we were going to try to protect ourselves, and we'd done that. And they uh, claimed that we had a bunch of clubs and uh, caused a lot of confusion. But, uh, now we have a picture that I wonder if you could look at and see if you could identify. That's Albert Cox and uh, McGill and me. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> see, I, I ain't seen her in ages. Have you seen that picture before? No. It was a while because he smoked taffy nuggets. And uh, it always had about a, that's Albert W. Cox, that's McGill, and that's old Sad Hawker Mill that she, she used to work at, out on Vanderbilt. Sad Hawker. You said the Selma Manufacturing Company, but it's old Sad Hawker Mill. Now, <laughs> What kind of feeling does this picture bring back to you? This way well, uh, okay. Now, tell us why you traveled with Cox. Well, I tried tried to help him organize it. Yeah, uh, say what uh, Cox. I tried yeah. to help Cox. Uh, he he. No, just instead of saying he, we need proper names. A, huh? we, we don't know who he is. So every time you're going to say he, replace. Um, well, he wasn't too good a persuader. No. Albert Cox wasn't. Yeah. He couldn't talk no, people. Sorry. Yeah. Albert Cox, he didn't know how to talk people into doing anything. And he knows I could uh, kind of talk people into things, and that's the reason he wanted me to go with it. And so I agreed to do it, and my wife agreed to let me do it. And uh, John Dean and Molly Dowd, they stayed most of the time in Birmingham and Atlanta. And Alice Bear stayed in Birmingham because her home was in Birmingham. Her other's in Bessemer. 
and uh, and I reckon Miguel still live, lives down there somewhere. Did they pay you for this? Yeah, the international did. Uh, paid my motel bill and eating bill, and uh, fifty dollars a week, and paid Albert Cox a. Uh, uh, I think it was $150 a week, plus expenses. That was good money at that time. Yeah. I put that thing on the back after I talking with you. Huh? Yeah. Okay, now, after the strike, you were blacklisted, blackballed. Yeah. By the age of 90 of us. Just wanted to say after the strike. But one, one very important thing, when, this, when they call off the strike, President Roosevelt called off the strike, yeah. and, or Gorman called off the strike. Yeah. How did you feel about Roosevelt calling off the strike? Well, uh, I thought it was good if the, all companies did follow up what he suggested. But they would they didn't do it. Sorry, let's start again and, and use Roosevelt rather than he there, okay? Uh, Roosevelt, after he uh, issued that ultimatum, well, I, I, I thought that Roosevelt had a good idea, but the company over here didn't think so. And so uh, at that time, it was called Light Manufacturing Company. That was before Cone ever got possession of it. And uh, how did you feel about Roosevelt uh, when the company didn't follow what uh, Roosevelt promised that they would get the job? Well, let's, let's hold on to a second. Uh, let's wait on this plane or whatever I'm hearing. The same, same difference. All right, now uh, just to explain that Roosevelt. <coughs> Uh, issued an ultimatum. Uh, just say Roosevelt issued an, issued an ultimatum, and what happened? Well, the company wouldn't comply with it. that. No, well, Dwight, start, Dwight start with, Sorry, start with Roosevelt issued an ultimatum. Yeah, Roosevelt issued an ultimatum for all employees that was on strike to call off the strike and go back on your job like you come out and. Albert Cox, John Dean, and some other feller went up to the company management, and uh, they wouldn't have it that way. And the only way they'd have it, the employees come back through the employment office and apply for a job. And uh, they called a meeting down there in the old cargo hall on Canterbury. And that suggestion to call it off and go back through the employment office, and I got to object that. They won't know my objection. See, I wasn't working at that time. And uh, I said, 13 weeks ago, Albert Cox, and John Dean, and Molly Dowd got up on that stage and asked the people to strike. And now you sign people as getting up and ask the people to go back and see if you can get a job. I said, I object, sit down, you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, left out by the age of 90 of them. You, well, you got a list of them. And, uh, some of them never did get back. And won't, if they're still standing today, they still wouldn't be back. Let's wait just a minute. We've got a record that at that meeting that you're talking about, yeah. when you got up and stood up, yeah. that people voted not to go back. They did. Could you just uh, explain that, that the people at that meeting? See, see uh, the, one of the employees sitting out in the audience was a member of the union, got up, and he objected to calling off strike because he had a job in there. But the, the, and the people voted what was there to not go back and apply for a job. But there went uh, John Dean, Albert Cox, Molly Dowd, they went ahead and arranged it the way the company wanted it to do. 
No, in, in other words, uh, the people were sold out on. Okay, now we've got a headline from the local paper here explaining that uh, there was there was a uh, an injunction gotten out against. A bunch okay, let me they had one against me. Let me show you that. Just read that headline. Uh, Dwight strike ends after injunction. See, uh, when they got the injunction, you had to go back to work then. You, you didn't have no law to do, but to go back to work. And uh, see, uh, way way back then, this was a non-union town, real against the Union. At one time, uh, city, county, chamber of commerce uh, didn't want no, no Union employees in the whole county. And, uh, but uh, Goodyear was one of the first ones to organize, and then the steel plant, and then Dwight. And, uh, but I'll say this, that organized labor has ruined Eddie Wall County. Let's take that back from him. Their, their demands is too much. Now, uh, talk back to that injunction. Were you named in this injunction? Uh, I'm pretty sure I am. <laughs> Hobson Shanefield, uh, Beyond Dayson, Burns Cox, uh, How did you feel then? How did your family feel about your being listed on that injunction? Well, uh, 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 for, just a moment. Yeah. It's on a popular corner. Uh, uh, at, at that time, I didn't much care because I'd done been sold out anyhow. Uh, the union done sold people out over there. What and, happened to you then? Well, uh, I worked to uh, a carpenter, and I worked to him a while, and I said, well, I'll go back in supervision. Old man Horvath had a mill in Dallas, Texas on South Lamar and Corinth, called Dallas Cotton Mill. He wanted me to come out there and run it. I went out there and he owned one over in Fort Worth. And uh, finally liquidated out in Dallas and I went over out in Fort Worth and finally liquidated it. But uh, then he called me to run out in Houston, Massachusetts. I was going to run by a water wheel. And, uh, I didn't like Houstonic, Massachusetts to start with. The, them, them people didn't want no Southerner up there to start with. And you go in a, you go in a restaurant, order a hamburger, you got two pieces of bun and a piece of hamburger meat. You didn't get no tomatoes, no mustard, no ketchup, or no nothing. <laughs> Did they do that up north, up New York? Did they do it that way up in New York? We started incorporating tomatoes. <laughs> but uh, but I worked for when I left uh, and come back uh, south. Uh, I stayed out of textiles till uh, I went to uh, the company in South Carolina. They was widening out loom. And old man Sutton, he was over in, he lived in Alabama City, and he was over at Hillside Mill in LaGrange. And he asked me one Saturday, he said, well, won't you come over there to where I'm at and help me widen out them loom? And so I did. And uh, when we got through the transfers to Alabama City, and see, I done had an injunction not to even go in the gate. 
but I went in anyhow. That never did bother me. And uh, when we got nearly through, they asked me to accept the job. So they'd done blackballing me. And, well, I agreed to take the job. And I stayed till they started to liquidate it, and I taken the layoff before any of the rest of them did because they needed uh, the people that was in there to be involved. They needed the money worse than I did. Now, how long after you got blackballed did you get back into Dwight? 54, 1954. That was 20 years? Yeah. Okay, so that. See, uh, it does, uh, uh, so let's start again. You said that uh, 20 years, uh, it was 20 years after I got blackballed that I finally got back into Dwight. Yeah. And then tell about what you did, all right? Well, uh, when I just lowered my hand, you said uh, it was 20 years. And, and I went to work with Draper Company for one time. Sorry. I need to, you to tell that story again. Just 20 years after I got blackballed, I got hired back at Dwight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I went over there, me and Mr. Sutton. No, I, see, I'm sorry, I want you to say 20 years so the audience would know yeah. that. Okay. Well, after 20 years, uh, uh, Mr. Sutton, a friend of mine, uh, we was working together at Hillside Mill in LaGrange, Georgia. And we finished the job over there. And the company transfers both to Dwight and Alabama City. And, uh, but Dwight had an injunction against me, forbidding me from coming on the property. But it didn't bother me. I went on the property. And when I got through, they wanted me to take a job after they had an injunction against me. Now, how long after the injunction? Uh, well, the injunction was in the 30s, and that was in 54, so it was about 20 years. And you worked in that 20 years, where did you work? Well, uh, I worked for Draper Company about two years. But, I mean, uh, just... I have a better way of it. Okay, all right. Last time I was here, you said that you, after you were blackballed, you looked in the textile worker magazine, and they were advertising for displaced workers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Southern, te Southern, Southern textile bulletin. Yeah. Southern, Southern textile, textile bulletin. bulletin. Okay. So I want you to start with the Good. time after you were blackballed, and how you were able to find work using that newspaper, and then where you went to. And well, if you could mention displaced workers, it'll help us because we're trying to tell a story uh, of a lot of workers. I used to know a lot of draper men that sold draper parts, and they know where the jobs was available at, what kind of job and what it paid. And uh, I'd meet them up there uh, at the office, and I, I'd follow up on them, what they'd tell me, and I got some jobs through them. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. But what about this Southern Textile Bulletin? Can you, you, that's what you told me last time I was here. Well, uh, I got one job in Aragon, Georgia through it. Uh, one of the assistant overseer for, for the night shift. I was from six till six. And uh, Clyde Love was a day shift overseer. How'd you find that job? Through Southern Textile Bulletin. Okay. Was this was this in uh, 1934? Didn't you go to Texas right after 34? No. To Dallas? No, no I, I didn't go to Texas until 40. Okay. I left here in 40 and came back in 50. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that what we were trying to understand is right after you were blackballed, you had to go out and look for work. Yeah. And we would like to know a little bit about that journey and how you initially started to find work. Well, I went to... Uh, Could you start with after I was blackballed? Uh, after the blackballed, the first real job I had was uh, with a draper company putting down new looms. Uh, the Trine, Georgie, we put down 250 draper looms. And, uh, but I got that through a part salesman and uh, 
Now, when we talk with other people who've been blackballed, particularly in Georgia, they told us that if you went to another mill, they would say, where have you been working? Yeah. And they would get it, they'll call back to the mill where you came, and if they found out you were a striker, they'll say, we don't need you. We're sorry, we don't need you. That's right. Could you tell that story? Well, uh, they, uh, all textiles kept in touch with each other. And uh, the black ball list was forwarded on to all other textile mills in the south, the southeast. And uh, uh, if you went and applied to the job, where are you from? I'm from Alabama City, Alabama. Well, do you belong to Union over know there? Yes, I belong to Union. Well, uh, let me see here. Uh, see if we need anybody. We don't need anybody at the present time, but we'll uh, uh, keep your address and get in touch with you if we need you. But that was that was a tale that they told everybody that went and applied for a job, and that's why I never did go apply for a job because I know what they did tell me, and no use for me to pay an expense of going somewhere else out of town and uh, get told the same thing. And uh, but uh, finally, in '40, Mr. Horvath called me. And I went to Dallas, Texas, and run a night shift for him, uh, overseer of weaving. And it, I, he run it about three years, and he liquidated it. And at the time, he had two. He had a textile over in Fort Worth, and he asked me to go over there, and I did. I was really living in Fort Worth and commuting to Dallas because there's too many niggers and uh, Mexicans living in Dallas. And the guy's community is 29 miles from Fort Worth to Dallas. And, uh, and run it about three years and he liquidated it. And then uh, I went to work with the A.W. Brunson Construction Company. He was uh, built commercial buildings. He lived in Grapevine, Texas. Let's hold up here, sir. For him as a labor yep. foreman. Mm -hmm. He furnished Jamie. me a new pickup truck. Mm -hmm. That's them. Well, I was born and raised here, for one thing. And, uh, it wasn't a job because I didn't have one when I come back here. I come back on two weeks vacation. But uh, uh, I loafed around here a while and went down to Avondale Mill in, down on First Avenue in Birmingham and went to uh, supervisor on the second shift in the upstairs weave room. And uh, I stayed with it a good while and I guess about two years. And uh, let's see, where did I go from there? Okay, 